the west of Ireland, with its rivers full of salmon, is a grand place to go fishing. Sinclair Yates has been trying to catch salmon for three days, but without success. He starts his journey home, travelling by train, which in the early years of the 20th century is an experience full of interest and surprises. People say there is no smoke without fire, but that was not true in the station waiting room where I had to wait for my train. There was certainly plenty of smoke, but the fire seemed quite dead. When I complained to the station master, he said that any chimney in the world would smoke in a south-easterly wind. He was, however, sympathetic, and took me to his own fire in his office, where the steam rose in clouds from my wet boots. We talked of politics and salmon fishing, and I had to confess that on my three-day trip I had not caught a single fish. Before the signal for my train was received, I realized for the hundredth time the wonderful individuality of the Irish mind and the importance of the personal element in Ireland. If you ask people for help, they will break rules, ignore official advice, make special arrangements, all just to please you. I found a seat in a carriage, and the train dragged itself noisily out of the station. A cold spring rain. The time was the middle of a most unseasonal April. Poured down as we came into the open. I closed both windows and began to read my wife's letter again. Philip often says I do not read her letters, and as I was now on my way to join her and my family in England, it seems sensible to study again her latest letter of instructions. Such bad luck that you haven't caught any salmon? If the worst comes to the worst, and you still haven't by the time you join us, couldn't you buy one? I hit my knee with my hand. I had forgotten about the damn fish. Philippa would say, Sinclair, I was right. You don't read my letters, do you? It's a pity she never learns from these frequent experiences. I don't mind being called a fool, but then I should be allowed to forget things as fools do. Without doubt, Philippa had written to Alice Harvey, whose house we were staying in for the next week, and told her that Sinclair would be only too delighted to bring her a salmon. And Alice Harvey, who was rich enough to find much enjoyment in saving money, would have already planned the meal down to the last fishbone. Anxiously thinking about this, I travelled through the rain. About every six miles we stopped at a station. At one, the only event was that the station master presented a newspaper to the guard. At the next, the guard read aloud some interesting facts from it to the driver. The personal element was strong on this line of the Munster and Connacht Railway. Routine, hated by all artistic minds, was disguised by conversation. According to the timetable, we were supposed to spend ten minutes at Carrick Station, but it was fifteen before all the market people on the platform had climbed onto the train. Finally, the window of the carriage next to mine was thrown open, and an angry English voice asked how much longer the train was going to wait. The station master who was deep in conversation with the guard and a man carrying a long parcel wrapped in newspaper, looked round and said seriously, The man with the parcel turned away and studied an advertisement, his shoulders shaking. The guard put his hand over his mouth. The voice, 
even angrier now, demanded the earliest time its owner could get to Belfast. "'You'll be asking me next when I take me breakfast,' replied the stationmaster calmly. There was a moment's lively discussion, and the stationmaster replied, "'I'm sorry, sir. He's only just bought it, in this little delay we have. But why don't you run down and get one for yourself? There are six or seven of them down at Coffee's, selling cheap. There'll be time enough. We're waiting for the mail train to pass through in the other direction, and it hasn't been signalled yet. I jumped from the carriage and ran out of the station at top speed, followed by a shout from the guard that he wouldn't forget me. Congratulating myself on the influence of the personal element, I hurried through the town. On my way, I met a red-faced, heated man carrying another salmon, who informed me there were still three or four fish at Coffee's, and that he was running from the train himself. Coffee's is the house with the boots in the window, he called after me. She'd sell a tenpence a pound if you're stiff with her. Ten pence a pound, I thought, at this time of year. That's good enough. I saw the boots in the window and rushed through a dark doorway. At that moment, I heard, horrifyingly near, the whistle of the approaching mail train. My very public return to my seat was greeted with great sympathy by the seven countrywomen who were now in my carriage. I was hot and out of breath, and the eyes of the seven women were fixed on me with deep and untiring interest. After a while, one of them opened the conversation by supposing it was at coffees I got the salmon. I said it was. How could an honest gentleman win a battle with her? At the next station, they climbed out. I helped them with their heavy baskets, and in return they told me I was a fine man, and they wished me well on my journey. They also left me with the information that I was soon to present the highly respectable Alice Harvey with a stolen salmon. The afternoon passed cheerlessly into evening, and my journey did not get any better. Somewhere in the grey half-light I changed trains, and again later on, and at each change the salmon lost some of its newspaper wrapping. I wondered seriously whether to bury it in my suitcase. At the next station we paused for a long time. Nothing at all happened, and the rain beat patiently on the carriage roof. I closed my eyes to avoid the cold stare of the salmon and fell asleep. I woke up in total darkness. The train was not moving, and there was complete silence. I could see a lamp at the far end of a platform so I knew we were at a station. I lit a match and discovered from my watch that it was eleven o'clock, exactly the time I was supposed to board the mail train. I jumped down and ran along the platform. There was no one on the train. There was no one even in the engine, which was making sad little noises to itself in the silence. There was not a human being anywhere. The name of the station was just visible in the darkness, and I realized that only the personal element stood between me and a sleepless night on a cold, wet station platform. No, I said crossly. Well, if you were, you'd be late, said the voice. I received this useful information in annoyed silence, and tried to wrap myself in a disappearing dream. "'I'm going on the six-thirty myself,' continued the voice, "'and it's unknown to me how I'll put on me boots.'
You would not believe how me feet swelled up in me dancing shoes last night. Me feet are delicate like that, you see. I pretended to be asleep, but the dream was gone, and so was any chance of further sleep. The first prize for reels got down from the billiard table presenting an extraordinary picture. He was wearing grass green breeches, a white shirt and pearl grey stockings. He undressed and put on ordinary clothes including his painful boots. He then removed himself and his things to the hall where he had a loud conversation with the boy. Meanwhile, I crawled out of my hiding place to renew my struggle with life. Fortunately, the boy soon appeared with a cup of tea. I've wrapped the salmon up in brown paper for you, sir, he said cheerfully. It's safe to take across Europe with you if you like. I'll just run up to the station now with the luggage. Would you mind carrying the fish yourself? It's on the table in the hall. My train went at 6.15. The boy had put my case in one of the many empty carriages and stayed with me, making pleasant conversation until the train departed. I'm sorry you had a bad night, sir, he said, and I must tell you, it was only that Jimmy Durkin, he's the first prize for real, sir, had taken a few drinks. Why did it crash? A salmon? cried Philippa, staring at the parcel. There was now a small pool around it, spreading over the floor. But that's whiskey. Can't you smell it? The servant came respectfully forward. He knelt down and cautiously picked pieces of a broken glass bottle out of the brown paper. The smell of whiskey became stronger. I'm afraid the other things are ruined, sir, he said seriously, and pulled out of the parcel, one after the other, a very large pair of dancing shoes, two long grey stockings, and a pair of grass-green breeches. They were greeted with wild enthusiasm and doubtless much the same way as when they shared the success of Mr. Jimmy Durkin at the Fesh, but Alice Harvey was not amused. You know, dear, she said to Philippa afterwards, I don't think it was very clever of dear Sinclair to take the wrong parcel. I had wanted that salmon. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.